Hi everyone and welcome to Behind the Numbers. My name is Dave Bookbinder and this is the show where we dig deeper to understand what matters most in business. Today's guest is an entrepreneur. He's a disruptor. He is author of the book Back of the Napkin to Business Plan in 11 Slides. He's also the host of the Brandon White Show and I am talking about Brandon White. Brandon, welcome to Behind the Numbers. Thanks for having me on, Dave. It's a pleasure. Um, quite a mouthful of an intro there. What did I miss? Tell the audience a little bit about yourself. Yeah, well, thanks. Um, I guess the best way to explain myself is I, I'm an entrepreneur with two exits. I was a venture capitalist. I do some angel investing and I still build my own company. So I am the founder of a personal contacts manager that has never worked right any piece of software for me called Trevelli. That's great. We're going to hopefully have some time to talk about all of these things, but why don't you tell the audience a little bit about your backstory? You've got a fascinating story about how you kind of got started. Yeah, so I, to be honest, um, I was lost after college and maybe some other people can relate to that, but I didn't know what I was going to do. I went back to a tree nursery where I had worked during the summers to pay my way through school. And um, I was grew up with a single mom and as a single mom who had sacrificed a lot for my brother and I, I didn't think she wanted her son. Not that there's anything wrong with working on tree nursery, but after investing in private schools and pretty expensive college education, I think she wanted me to go do some other things, which she was probably right, and not live at home. So maybe that was the motivation, and, and I've attributed some other things to it, but she, maybe she wanted me out of the house. Um, and so she said, hey, you should go back to school. And when you go back to school, you should go get a master's degree. And when you're in school, you're going to be able to do, there's going to be so much there for you. You're going to have so many opportunities, be exposed to so many things and not be going to work every morning at eight o'clock in the morning till six o'clock at night and not having time to really figure things out. And I, I said, okay, well, I think that's a good idea. I went back and started my master's in psychology where I got my undergraduate and I love psychology and, and it was good. And, at worst case, I figured I could become a psychologist and charge people by the hour and help some people out and make a good living. But I was, a, I am, and I was a big fisherman and I was looking for a magazine that targeted fly fishermen and light tackle fishermen. And there wasn't anything like that. There was a general magazine that did like bait fishing and stuff. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it, not my type of fishing. And I said, you know, I want to I want to build a magazine. So I went to the local printer in town who very kindly threw about 50 questions, made me realize that I didn't have enough money with the $800 in my bank account at the time. Um, I didn't know what I was doing and I would probably fail if I did it. And I thought to myself, all the other things that he said, I wasn't were that worried about maybe I should have been it was the $800 in my bank account that I couldn't print my first edition that I was mostly worried about so I went back and I there was this thing called the internet this is the 90s and I thought to myself well why can't I just put a magazine online so I did that uh, long and short as I recruited the best kid I could find out of the computing lab I got a part-time job working at a of all things spinach farm one of the biggest in the united states i was doing financials and just accounting work for them and i used that money to pay him and we started off on our journey of putting a very revolutionary i'm laughing halfway putting it in a magazine on the internet and we did that and it got a lot of traction really fast i figured out how to game the system by we had message boards that we actually built back then and I was five people on the message board talking to myself, so it appeared that there was activity. And then I used to read every morning, and there was an article in Time Magazine. So for some people listening to this, they'll remember in the beginning of Time Magazine, there was basically a mini tech crunch. And it was, here's what's happening in tech. It was sometimes, Dave, almost ha only half the page, you might remember. And one week there was a article about uh, Jerry Yang and David Philo, who had started this company called Yahoo and had just raised, don't quote me the right number. I, re I can remember the article like I'm looking at it right now because it was so impactful in my life. I think it was $1.75 million or something around there from Sequoia Capital. And I looked at the, the guy who I was working with me and I was like, you know, 
if they can do it, we can do it. They're just putting a phone book on the internet, basically. And I wrote a, I got a book, drove to Barnes and Noble in Annapolis, Maryland. I'm from Maryland originally. I live in Half Moon Bay, California now, but, um, got a book on how to write a business plan, read the book, wrote a business plan and sent it to Sequoia Capital. Like, like, you know, Dave, they should send you a check, right? That obviously no one ever got back to me, but I also wrote to a bunch of other people, one guy in the alumni magazine from where I went to college and which was Washington College on the Eastern Shore of Maryland, which is a small, very good liberal arts school. And it was an article about how he was going to become a venture capitalist and investing and whatever. He's really looking for deal flow. I wrote him. I knew him. He was a senior when I was a freshman and he was interested. And one day we were, we kept talking and one day he came back and you have to realize, Dave, I have no idea how to raise money. Like I just decided one day that I was going to raise money just because we needed money. I didn't know how else to do it. So uh, to really scale, we didn't need, we got started and we bootstrapped it, and, but working on a Spanish farm and paying your computer guy. And I knew basic from a Commodore 64 and before that Vic 20, like just wasn't going to cut it. Basically me doing business development, writing articles and coding. So, uh, he's, he, I get an email from this guy. I don't want to say his name, uh, just so he doesn't get 5,000 emails, <laughs> but he said, Hey, I, I met a guy at lunch that I think you should meet. He actually is an investor and he uses your site. And he said, I didn't tell him who you were just for privacy, but if you're okay with it, I think I should make an introduction. I was like, make the introduction, man. So he, so three hours later, I get an email that says, Hey, this is Tom. You might, um, I worked at, he had just retired. He was one of the original partners from Sequoia Capital. And he's like, Hey, this is Tom. You might know my firm Sequoia. Uh, we did companies like Yahoo, Apple, Cisco. Now, Dave, you have to imagine yourself and listeners. You're, I'm sitting in a house that in Eastern Maryland on the Maryland's Eastern shore that my wife and I scrapped every last penny to buy, which was $108,000 at the time. And you get an email like that. You don't believe that email right? because that often doesn't happen that a par partner from Sequoia Capital shows up on your doorstep. You hope it's going to happen. So I wrote back very nonchalantly, Hey, it's so nice to meet you. Uh, I attached the business plan. I'd love to talk to you about it. And, and I'm paraphrasing the, the story a little bit. And he said, well, I want to come see you tomorrow. <laughs> he wrote back. So I was like, here's my address. I'll see you tomorrow. I mean, Dave, come on, right? Like this is, this is like the emails that you used to get on the internet that says, uh, I'm from Nigeria and, and I'm, I'm, I don't know. You have a $5 million that your long lost uncle had like, right. so, I mean, I was prepared, but I didn't really think it was going to happen. And the next day I got a knock at my door and he showed up and I was surprised, excited. So I let him in my house. It's a very small house. It's like my wife and I had this 1400 square house for a really long time. And he said, we, we had some small talk and he said, well, let's go to the office. I was like, just turned around and started walking upstairs, Dave, because that's where the office was. It was a spare bedroom that I made into an office. So I just turned around and I looked back, he wasn't following me. And I looked down the steps. This is an old East coast house. And he's like, had this perplexed look on his face. And I was like, come on up now at this point, I'm like, okay, I'm, this is pretty much going to be over fast because he clearly thought that I needed to have a office. So I walked into the spare bedroom and he doesn't say anything. And he looks around. It's not, it's like 10 by 12. And he said, is this all you have? Now, at this point, I'm getting a rush of adrenaline for feeling embarrassed. I, my temperature of my face went up probably 30 degrees and I can feel beads of sweat starting on my forehead. So I'm a cool cat. I just, I was like, Hey, look, you know, this is it. Um, if you want to see the other anything else, my partner has a spare bedroom that he converted that he works in. It's like 20 minutes away, but that's it. 
So I'm really sorry that you drove. Uh, he had moved to the East Coast at the time, and he had come from Washington, D.C. to the Eastern Shore, which is, you know, about 90 minutes, maybe a little bit more from the side of town he was from, and uh, maybe two hours or, or so. I said, look, I'm really sorry. I started apologizing. And he just looked at me straight in the eye, and he said, calm down, kid. Um, I thought you were bigger. You look bigger on the Internet. I called your number. You have, like, a phone tree. Um but don't worry, this is how we found Cisco. And they did, they found Cisco systems with a husband and wife making routers on the, on the floor. And Sequoia was the only private investor in Cisco prior to going public. So, you know, you get goose, I still get goosebumps telling that story. And then I said, well, we started talking, we could go to lunch. We, he does the business plan. He's like, what's your business plan? I said, I sent you the business plan, but you know, we can go over it. He turns over a placemat turns over the placemat at this place, I don't even know if it's still around, called Washington Street Pub in Easton, Maryland. And he writes down product market people financing. And he's like, fill the, let's fill this in. And he literally got the pen out of his pocket and we start writing this business plan. Have a good lunch, I give him the spiel. He folds it up, puts it in his pocket. Um, and I was like, hey, you wanna go fishing? And he's like, right now. And I was like, yeah, right now. He's like, yeah, let's go fishing. So I went back, I hooked up the boat, literally, and we drove to the boat ramp, we went fishing, had a great time on the way home. He said, how much money do you have in your bank account? And I said, I, I don't know how much money I have in my bank account. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, we trade stocks to fund the company. And he said, what does that mean? And I said, well, what it means is what it means. We trade stocks. He's like, you trade stocks with the company money. I'm like, I am the company. <laughs> it's my money. Yeah, that's what we do. I said, I can have 7,000 or 20. Depends on what my partner has done today. And we were building websites, Dave, and doing things. But you have to remember, this is, 90, early, this is late 90s, not, not 99 yet, but like 2000, 1998, 1999. Um, you know, websites and having a website... I mean, there was AOL and Amazon had just come out and there were, the internet was making its way, but it wasn't, it wasn't like everybody needed a website or you had to have a website. It was like a really early adopters had agreed to that. So I, he just shakes his head and I don't know what he's doing because we're driving down a major highway at 65 miles an hour and I'm towing a boat on the way home and he handed me a check for $50,000 and he's like, hey, let's go. Um, can't trade that. He was half joking, but he's like, no, I'm serious. And that's how I started. And we raised a million dollars three months later, and I was off to the races. Now, the story gets a little bit crazy because dot-com crashed. I bought the company back from the investors because I was either crazy, stupid, or or a visionary. <laughs> that kind of visionary would be, in retrospect, looking at it because the Internet obviously has taken off. And I grew that. I did some other things as a venture capitalist. I worked at America Online in, the, uh, in those early days. Um, and then I, I got my, I went to business school, uh, but I eventually sold that company and to a large public media company that is still around. It's based out of Canada. And they were, when they bought us, they were probably at a few billion dollar market cap. And, um, that's how I got this studio that I am in Half Moon Bay. And that's how I really got started. Brandon, we are late for a commercial break. Sit tight. Uh, folks watching and listening, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back on Behind the Numbers after this quick break. Un ataque cerebral puede ser fácil de detectar. Su ser querido no logra hablar o quizás no puede moverse. Pero existe otro síntoma de ataque cerebral que muchos de nosotros no vemos. Se llama negligencia espacial y puede ocurrir durante o después de un ataque cerebral, causando movimientos visuales distorsionados. Afortunadamente, existe una solución que utiliza tecnología óptica basada en prismas durante la rehabilitación. Si usted o su ser querido experimenta un ataque cerebral, pregúntele a su doctor sobre la negligencia espacial. Encuentre más información en KesslerFoundation.org. Weeds, they have you surrounded. You just gonna stand there? Or are you gonna take your loan back? We're gonna take it back. We're gonna take it back. With Scott's Turf Builder, triple action. It gets three jobs done at once. And welcome back to Behind the Numbers. I'm Dave Bookbinder, and today we're talking with Brandon White. And Brandon, thanks for setting the stage with that great backstory. But I want to jump into uh, the book, Back of the Napkin uh, to Business Plan in 11 Slides. Um, tell the audience what they're going to learn from that book and what inspired you to write it. 
Yeah, um, you're gonna learn how to write a business plan in 11 slides. I built that because you need a quick business plan and you need to get your business plan done and figure out what it is. And I wrote exactly what we did in a really easy to comprehend book, mainly because I got tired of repeating myself. I taught a course on it and I just think that people should be able to, if they, if they have a dream or they have an idea or whatever it is, you gotta get that business, you gotta write a quick business plan and you gotta get to work. So I did it in 11 slides. I'm happy to just walk you through those 11 slides really quickly. I just give the audience, your audience, the 11 slides and you can buy the book, you can listen to my podcast, I, I have it for free. Um, Cause I really do, when I wrote the business plan, it was 50 pages long and the ability to do a business plan in 11 slides or, or you know, you could even adjust it if you wanted to shorter is um, re- very empowering. So look, I'll just walk through the slides really quickly, Dave, yeah. if, that, if that's okay for your audience and then that'd be great. they can d- dive in themselves if they're interested. Yeah, I think that'd be great. I think they'd get a lot of value out of that. So please, by all means, go ahead. So slide one is your elevator pitch and your elevator pitch needs to be less than 15 seconds. Um, A good elevator pitch is we fix bad haircuts. Uh, We don't, there's no negotiation. The price is what it is to buy a new car or we help you find files you know you have but can't find. That would be a good, those are three examples of a good elevator pitch. It takes a long time to get there, but you need that. You have a problem. So a person does something, their pain is existing solutions are broken because you have a solution and you have it saves money makes money makes you happy i just made that up but it has to be you can see my pace here and how how you have to have this um to be able to say it that simply and it is that simple so you have your elevator pitch your problem you have a solution you have your market opportunity basically what what is your market and how you're going to get it you have your go to market how are you going to go to market are you going to sell on the internet what's your business model uh traction and milestones what are those who's your competition Slide eight is your financials, which you do need to figure out if you can actually make money. Who's your team? How much money is it gonna cost to get you this thing or service that you're gonna build? And then a summary. And those are the 11 slides. So you're you're an investor as well um, as an entrepreneur. So you've been on both sides of the funding equation, right? So if you receive a business plan that's 11 slides, I I assume that you're gonna buy into that, but just for the folks who are maybe skeptical, is it oversimplistic, Brandon? Uh, no, and I live in Silicon Valley, and Silicon Valley pretty much expects something like that. You also have to remember investors don't have a lot of time. I mean, when I when I was a venture capitalist and we, we were inundated with business plans, as an angel investor, I still get a lot of plans. I do not have, and investors do not have, an hour to spend on one plan when they're getting, you know, I'm exaggerating, but... A hundred a week wouldn't be unrealistic for a big firm. An angel investor could see 10 deals a week. Like they don't have 10 hours. You need to be able to say what I say. That's why you uh, say what you have quickly. That's why I think that elevator pitch is really important. And because you got to grab someone's attention, right? I mean, just think about the internet right now. Everybody's scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. How are you going to get them to stop? That's basically what's happening happening on the influx of investors. They're scrolling business plans. And how are you going to get them to stop? So if it, and if it's any more complicated than that, and you can't make it simple, then there's probably a problem with your business. Yeah. What's been your experience in terms of business owners actually having a business plan by the time you run into them? Um, not everybody has it. I mean, there's a lot of people that have great ideas, but don't have the plan and they, they don't want to do the plan because the plan's hard. Hopefully 11 slides is easy, but um, good entrepreneurs have a plan. Um, ones that are getting started and don't, you're winging it. Having said that, doesn't mean you have to have a full plan, but you do have to have a plan, right? Like what's the market? Um, you're going to eventually get hit punched in the face with, with these questions. So, if you don't want to start with it, I would just start with like some basic financials. Can I make this and make money? Or what price do I have to charge and will the market accept it? You you may not, you could write this on the back of a napkin. That's really the point is you could do it, but you should do something like that to make sure because if you have an idea to make a widget and it caught, that widget costs $100 and you can only charge 75 for it, obviously that's not a bad, that's a bad business. 
Yeah. Brandon, for folks who are watching and listening want to learn more about you, how they can connect with you, what's the best way to do that and where can they find the book? The best place is just go to my personal website, brandoncwhite.com. That's B-R-A-N-D-O-N-C as in Charlie, white.com. Awesome. One of the biggest things that we tend to learn from entrepreneurs is from, from these so-called failures. And you mentioned a couple strikeouts in your, in your bio. And I w- wonder if you could share some insights with the audience as some of the key takeaways that you learned in those so-called strikeouts. Uh, you got to keep getting to the plate. Actually, I think some entrepreneurs believe that they've got to make their idea, the idea, the one they've been thinking about forever, the thing that happens. And the thing that I will tell you, which is still hard for me to this day, even with doing Trevelli, is if you just listen to the customers, Dave, they will tell you what to build. Now you need to interpret it because sometimes they're going to tell you to build things that are edge cases. So you do have to determine that. But in general, if you listen to your customers and you get on customer calls and you spend time in customer service, you're gonna figure out how you're doing, what's not working well, and what you should do. And I think that that is what I've learned from those failures and all those failures that I had which I say that in my bio because I think it's unrealistic to be like, oh, you had two exits and that's like miraculous. No, like I had 20 projects, I call them projects, they didn't even make it to be a business, right? That didn't even work. So uh, all those things added up to where I am today. Um, But, you know, and, and failures like, it's sort of cliche to say, but just get back up to the plate. You just gotta get up to the plate. Baseball players who bat 300 are considered rock stars. Right, you bat yeah. 400, you're awesome. Um, so just keep getting back up to the plate and, and listen to your customers and you will find a business or service that works. Yeah, and you mentioned that's how you got to where you are today. So why don't you tell us about what you're up to today? You mentioned Trevally. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, well, the long and short of it is, is that I needed a personal contact manager that had my friends, my family, and my professional relationships that actually worked so that had all my contacts in one spot, helped me keep them up to date because it's just data repository, they're not data aware, and then do things with them. And no contact manager did that, that I have, that I've seen. And I don't need a business CRM that quite candidly still don't work because they require too much manual labor to put in themselves. So I just decided to build it, Dave, and we're building a the world's best personal contact manager that puts all your contacts in one place, keeps them up to date properly and lets you do things with them, like contact them. Um, You might be planning a birthday party. You might be doing a project at work. You might need to manage your direct reports. Imagine that Dave, in a company, there's no tools to do that. And that's what this contact manager does. So if people are interested, you can go to my website, brandoncwhite.com, or just email me from my website. It's invite only right now. And um, I'm happy to, I I want feedback. So any listener that's interested and has that problem and has experienced that pain, um, I'm happy to talk to them and give them a look at what we're doing. Thanks for asking, Dave. No, sure. I think we all have. Uh, We're we're getting down to the short strokes here and there's so many things I want to cover, but um, I wanted to ask you to put your investor hat back on for a second. Um, and when you're dealing with entrepreneurs who are looking to raise capital, what are the things that you look for uh, that signals it's a good entrepreneur or a good business? And conversely, what are the things that turn you off? Well, the first thing is, is that you hear a lot of entrepreneurs, Dave, say, venture capitalists are, are evil and they turn me down and blah, blah, blah. You need to, the first thing you need to do is figure out if your business is investable. And what entrepreneurs don't understand is, is that venture capitalists, if we're using that word, uh, are looking for, they, their business requires them to make a hundred times their money on one out of 10 deals to make their fund and pay back their investors effectively. So can you, can, can your, in your company, if someone, if I invest a million dollars, can you return a hundred million dollars to me? And you need to do the math to understand that. And if not, it doesn't mean it's a bad business. It means that it might not be a fit for venture capital. It might be a fit to either borrow money or maybe get some friends and family money. 
those venture capital deals are sky are, are like moonshots. You got to you're going to be on a rocket ship. You might have a great company that does three million dollars a year and throws off a million dollars. I love that business, but a VC isn't going to invest in that business because it doesn't work for their model. But I might personally invest in that business because I'm going to get a dividend because the company is going to throw off cash. So you got to figure out is your business investable and what type it, what type of investor would fit that profile. And that's sort of the general framework I would offer as advice. Gotcha. Last thing before we bounce, real quick on the Brandon White Show in 60 seconds, what will listeners learn from catching up on the Brandon White Show? Uh, I just have really interesting people that have that we have interesting conversations, Dave. That, that is everyone. We've had Steve Case, who's the found, uh, co-founder of AOL. We've had the head of strategy for Google. We've had Navy SEALs. We've had uh, special operations, army people, warthog pilots, professional athletes. Uh, these are just conversations that's going to help you reach your peak performance and uh, generally that I find interesting and that people will find interesting listening to and feel inspired and get some advice to help guide their life. That's awesome. Brandon, unfortunately, we are out of time, but I want to thank you so much for joining us today on Behind the Numbers. Dave, thanks for having me. I'm really grateful. And it's a pleasure. Thank you. We've been talking with Brandon White today, entrepreneur and disruptor and author of Back of the Napkin to Business Plan in 11 Slides. Definitely check out his podcast, The Brandon White Show. A lot of good stuff going on there. I want to thank the Big Cheese for running the board today. I want to thank you, the audience, for watching and listening. We can't do the show without you. My name is Dave Bookbinder, and I'm the one that my clients turn to when they want to know what their most important assets are worth. So as I always say, if you're a business owner and you're like the 98% who don't know what your business is worth, we should have a conversation. Give me a call. Give me a check-in on LinkedIn. That's all we have for today, folks. We will see you next time on Behind the Numbers. Take care, everybody.